All right, fellow fact checkers, we've got a brand new sponsor, and I am excited to promote this product. It's Fox & Sons Coffee. Now, Fox & Sons Coffee is a family-owned and operated small business selling whole bean, organically roasted, amazingly good coffee. On their website, Steve, the company's founder, describes how his love of coffee started with special Saturdays with his dad when he was growing up. Steve wants to share his love of coffee with you and the entrepreneurial spirit with his sons. Check out the website, foxnsons.com and take a look at their best offer. A monthly subscription for three bags of coffee with free shipping for $38.89. Also, Steve's been on the show. He's a friend of the show. He follows us on the morning after as well as here on Fact Check This Podcast. Steve is a great dude, great company to support. So go check out Fox and & Sons Coffee and get your morning started off right with a bag of delicious Fox & Sons Coffee. Let's start the show. This episode will be completely taken out of context. Welcome to the Fact Check This Podcast. All right, Fact Check This Podcast, and I am going to do a run on a few different articles. Mostly, I'm just going to kind of read the article and give some of my thoughts on it. It's a number of different articles that I've been looking at for a few weeks, and I was trying to figure out a good way to incorporate them into the show. And I decided the best way to do that is just going to be to read them and talk about them. So we're going to start with one from New York Times uh, called There's More Than One Way to Ban a Book. Let me get this pulled up right quick. And also, I know I don't really talk about uh, like current event type stuff on here. I, tend to, I try to like be more topic focused. If you are interested in the current event stuff, if you want to hear me talking about Whatever's in the news, you can either tune in to the morning after every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7.30 a.m. Central, or you can tune in to Paddling Fiction, where Johnny Profita and I talk about whatever's going on in the news a couple times a week. So I, I do current event stuff, but I don't like doing that for this show, typically. So that is that is what it is. If you want the current events, this is not probably the show for it, but I do it other places. And you can tune in there. I'll put the links in the show notes so that you got access to all that stuff. So there's more than one way to ban a book. This is an opinion piece from Pamela Paul in the New York Times. In the 1950s, Vladimir uh, Nabovic Lolita was banned in France, Britain, and Argentina but not in the United States, where its publisher, Walter Minton, released the book after mul multiple American publishing houses rejected it. Minton is part of a noble tradition. Over the years, American publishers have fought back against efforts to repress a wide range of works, from Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species to Maya Angelou's I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. Just last year, Simon & Schuster defended its book deal with former Vice President Mike Pence, despite a petition signed by more than 200 Simon & Schuster employees and other book professionals demanding that the publishing house cancel the deal. The publisher, uh, Dana Kennedy, the chief executive, Jonathan Karp, held firm. The American publishing industry has long prided itself on publishing ideas and narratives that are worthy of our engagement, even if some people might consider them unsavory or dangerous, and for standing its ground on freedom of expression. But that ground is getting shaky. Though the publishing industry would never condone book banning, the subtler form of repression is taking place in the literary world, restricting intellectual and artistic expression from behind closed doors and often defending these restrictions with thoughtful sounding rationales. As many top editors and publishing executives admit off the record, the real strain of self-censorship has emerged that many otherwise liberal minded editors, agents and authors feel compelled to take part in. Over the course of his long career, John Sargent, who was chief executive of Macmillan, uh, Macmillan sorry, until last year, and is widely respected in the industry for his staunch defense of freedom of expression, witnessed the growing forces of censorship outside the industry with overt book banning efforts on the political right, but also within the industry through self-censorship and fear of public outcry from those on the far left. It's happening on both sides, Sargent told me recently. It's just a different mechanism. On the right, it's going through institutions and school boards, and on the left, it's using social media as a tool of activism. It's aggressively protesting to increase the pain threshold until there's censorship going the other way. In the face of those pressures, publishers have adopted a defensive crouch 
taking preemptive measures to avoid controversy and criticism. Now, many books the left might object to never make it to bookshelves because a softer form of banishment happens earlier in the publishing process, scuttling a project for ideological reasons before a deal is signed, or diffusing or eliminating sensitive material in the course of editing. Publishers have increasingly instituted a practice of sensitivity reads, something that first gained traction in the young adult fiction world, but has since spread to books of, uh, for readers of all ages. Though it has long been the practice to lawyer many books, sensitivity readers take matters on uh, to another level, weeding out anything that might potentially offend. Even when a potentially controversial book does find its way into print, other gatekeepers in the book world, the literary press, librarians, independent bookstores, may not review, acquire, or sell it, limiting the book's ability to succeed in the marketplace. Last year, when the American Booksellers Association included Abigail Schreier's book, Irreversible Damage, the Transgender Craze, Seducing Our Daughters, in a mailing to member booksellers, a number of booksellers publicly castigated the group for promoting a book they considered transphobic. The association issued a lengthy apology and subsequently promised to revise its practices. The group's board then backed away from its traditional support of free expression, emphasizing the importance of avoiding harmful speech. A recent overview in Publishers Weekly about the state of free expression in the industry noted many longtime book people have said what makes the present unprecedented is a new impetus to censor and self-censor coming from the left. When the reporter asked a half dozen influential figures at the largest publishing houses to comment, only one would talk, and only on condition of anonymity. This is the censorship that, as the phrase goes, dare not speak its name, the reporter wrote. The caution is born of recent experience. No publisher wants another American Dirt imbroglio in which a highly anticipated novel was accused of capitalizing on the migrant experience, no matter how well the book sells. No publisher wants the kind of staff walkout that took place in 2020 at Hatchet Book Group when a journalist, Ronan Farrell, protested its plan to publish a memoir by his father, Woody Allen. It's certainly true that not every book deserves to be published, but those decisions should be based on the quality of a book as judged by editors and publishers, not in response to a threatened, perceived, or real political litmus test. The heart of publishing lies in risk take, or in taking risks, not avoiding them. You can understand why the publishing world gets nervous. Consider what has happened to books that have gotten on the wrong side of illiberal scolds. On Goodreads, for example, vicious campaigns have circulated against authors for inadvertent offenses in novels that haven't even been published yet. Sometimes the outcry doesn't take place until after the book is in stores. Last year, a bunny in a children's picture book got soot on its face by sticking its head into an oven to clean it, and the book was deemed racially insensitive by a single blogger. It was reprinted with the illustration redrawn. All this after the book received rave reviews at a New York Times New York uh, Public Library Best Illustrated Children's Book Award. In another instance, a white academic was denounced for cultural appropriation because trap feminism, the subject of her book, Bad and Bougie, lay outside her own racial experience. The publisher subsequently withdrew the book. Pen America rightfully denounced the publisher's decision, noting that it detracts from public discourse and feeds into a climate where authors, editors, and publishers are disincentivized to take risks. Books have always contained delicate and challenging material that rubs up against some readers' sensitivities or deeply held beliefs. But which material upsets which people changes over time. Many stories about interracial cooperation that were once hailed for their progressive values to kill a mockingbird and to help are now criticized as white savior narratives. Yet these books can still be read, appreciated, and debated, not only despite, but also because of the offending material, even if only to better understand where we started and how far we've come. Having both worked in book publishing and covered it as an outsider, I've found that people in the industry are overwhelmingly smart open-minded, and well-intentioned. They aren't involved in some kind of evil plot. Book people want to get good books out there and uh, to as many readers as possible. The added challenge is that all of this is happening against the backdrop of a recent spate of shameful book, uh, book bans that comes largely from the right. According to the American Library Association, of the hundreds of attempts to remove books from schools and libraries in 2021, a vast majority were made in response to re content related to race and sex 
red meat for red states, with Texas and Florida ranking high amongst those determined to squash uh, to quash artistic freedom and limit reader access. Republican politicians for so long, uh, forces of intolerance, are now deep in the book banning business. We shouldn't capitulate to any repressive forces, no matter where they emanate from on the political spectrum. Parents, schools, and readers should demand access to all kinds of books, whether they personally approve of the content or not. For those on the illiberal left, the conduct of their own campaigns of censorship while bemoaning the book-burning impulses of the right is to violate the core tenets of liberalism. We're better than this. That's cute. I don't know that the uh, I don't know that the left is necessarily better than that, but it is an excellent article, and it points out something that I think I've talked about previously. I know I've talked about book bans before, and and the books that are being banned, and and, and when you look at the books that are that are being banned in these schools and stuff in in you know the red states in Florida and Texas. They're being banned from like elementary school libraries. And when you look at the content of the books, it makes sense. Like those are things that these are not a, like that. It's not appropriate for elementary school age children. If you want to put it in a middle school, maybe. If you want to put it in the high school, you know, that's probably fine. But like this stuff is not elementary school age content. And there's all this uproar about it. And then some of the other stuff is, uh, that it has been some of the other stuff that they claim has been banned hasn't at all, not even a little bit. And some of the other stuff, um, the reason that it gets banned is because it's just factually incorrect. I mean, some of this stuff is heavily opinionated, and but it's written as if it's historically accurate. And so this stuff is, and that's like that stuff that specifically plays towards the CRT type of stuff. And so, so these things are being removed from, from libraries and schools um, for those reasons. And then when you look at the left and the way that they do it, like the article does an excellent job of, of pointing out the way the left goes about banning books without actually banning books. Uh, they're, so I talk about the book all the time. And if you haven't read it already, I don't know what the fuck's wrong with it. Uh, the Calling of the American Mind is excellent. And it's it's a great example of how this whole book banning thing works. Uh, there were speakers, and, and not just speakers on the right, but like speakers who were largely progressive, but just didn't toe the line of every single psychosis induced thing that the left wants to promote who would be going to college campuses and there would be these big like cancel uprisings of students and and protesters uh, ensuring that the pe these people couldn't even come speak like shutting down the events before the events even had an opportunity to happen and physically attacking the people whenever they did make it to campus if they tried to go ahead and and hold the events and, and do the and and talk. And so so what it kind of got to was the point where like people just wouldn't even try. And you see it you see it on YouTube. I don't do it deliberately, but there is a certain extent to which I will think about and self-censor on the content that I'll put on YouTube. Facebook is even worse. These book publishers are going through the same thing. The authors are going through the same thing. Uh, everybody is, has seen and is aware of the, like the huge uprising against uh, J.K. Rowling and being a turf and for, you know, affirming that there are two genders and stuff like that like being a a normal feminist who actually believes in women and not uh the un indefinable women that progressives are pushing for 
Orson Scott Card is very right wing. He is very conservative. He's the author of Ender's Game and a number of other books. Uh, the, you see different authors like this who, once their opinions and beliefs are out there, then there's these huge campaigns to try to get them canceled, to cut, try to get their books removed, to, to try to get, if they have a new book coming out, to to either get it edited or censored or whatever. And overwhelmingly, this comes from the left, like almost entirely. The books that actually get published are typically incredibly left-leaning. And the ones who are publishing like more right-leaning books or things that are more like socially conservative or or even um, like morally conservative, more of a like a traditional Christian type of a basis on the books. They're being published by independent publishers or self-published, like where they publish through Amazon, which is kind of impressive that Amazon will allow pretty much anybody to publish whatever. Uh, but so. So what you're seeing is like these big book publishers. They understand that the vocal minority. Can create such a negative campaign against a book or an author. That. They just don't want the PR. Because if the woke mob comes up against this publisher because of this book then mainstream media is going to pick up on it. And that's all they're going to talk about is how terrible this is. Worst thing ever. Maybe well-reviewed. It may sell millions of copies. It'll never see the light of day because the author is a conservative Christian. Like, this is, this is the cancel culture that we're up against. It's not burning books. It's not banning books. It's allowing the mob to dictate what goes on in society. If you are an author or, or a content creator of some sort, of any sort, you cannot allow the mob to dictate what you what you do, what you say, what you write. In fact, as I said in a recent Substack piece, if the woke mob is against you, you're probably doing something right. So go do that. So subscribe to my Substack. It is campbellj.substack.com, or you can probably search for fact check this Substack. Be sure to check me out on the morning after every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7.30 a.m. Central. Check me out on Peddling Fiction with Johnny Profita uh, twice a week. It's typically Tuesdays and Fridays, but sometimes we go Wednesdays and Saturdays or whatever other random combination of the days we happen to fall on, given, uh, given that I have a weird schedule and Johnny is uh, freewheeling it in Mexico. Um, yeah, that's... I've got I've got several other uh, articles like this. Give me some feedback on this one. Let me know what I can do better in terms of the just the reading and and providing some uh, commentary on on these articles. I, I, I find these articles and I don't think I don't think a lot of people read this stuff, and it's really worth the read. It's it's really worth looking into. There are some good. There are some good articles that come out of some of these mainstream media sources. Uh, like this is from New York Times. I got another one that's from Bloomberg. Um, like they're not, they're not all terrible. I got one from Forbes. Like they're not all terrible, but they don't get any traction when they have a good one like like this. So, so let's talk about some some good articles that are out there and the fact that. These conversations are being had somewhere. They're just not getting a lot of attention. Hope everybody has a great rest of your day, great rest of your week. I will be back 
sometime with uh, another episode. And until then, have a good one. Don't forget to head over to PalomaVerdeCBD.com and check out our longest and most favorite sponsor, Carlos Vanessa Abelar and Paloma Verde CBD. Get all of your CBD needs and you get 10% off your order of $75 or more. Plus, anything over $75 is free shipping. So head over to PalomaVerdeCBD.com to get all your CBD needs. Have a good week, everybody.